I don't know about that baby thing, but uh, we're going to have a good time. How's everybody doing? I just want to say that my aunt and uncle just finished two years with Urban Tribes in South Africa. Yes, the McCabe's. And so we love, I got to see firsthand the fruits of what Urban Tribes is doing in Africa. And it is absolutely incredible. You are so right. And so we honor you guys and we'll be praying for you and supporting you. Um, It's excited for that. But excuse my voice. uh, I lost it during the game yesterday. For those who don't know, I'm a Gopher fan. Die hard. Yeah. Go ahead. I, it wasn't an accident that Pastor Jeff put me on for tonight. He, he, he speaks to God and he's a prophetic. So he put me up here for the ridicule of it all. So thank you for that. I did not lose my voice screaming. I lost it praying. Just so you know. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but uh, I'm so honored to be with you tonight. Uh, What a powerful service that we've had. I think we could just wrap up and bring everyone to the altars and praise Jesus, right? We've got new life, we've got sent out, and we've got testimony. Uh, God is so good. God is so good. But it it fits perfectly along with what I want to talk about tonight and encourage us all, myself included, talking about tonight and next Sunday night, so you'll need to come back for Pastor Zach. We're talking through uh, the thieves of Thanksgiving, the thief of Thanksgiving, and what during this season of, of gratitude and thankfulness and honestly abundance in our lives, how, what things can come and steal uh, those, uh, that, those thoughts of gratitude and our thanksgiving to Jesus And so make sure you come back next Sunday night, but uh, why don't you just join me as we pray. God, we thank you for what you already have done in this service, and we we praise your name, and your name be glorified. And I pray, God, that you would just help reveal things in the depths of our hearts so we would be able to move closer to you and your name. Amen. Amen. So how many of you would say Thanksgiving is your favorite holiday? Raise your hand. No, there's no shame. What about Christmas? How many of you, okay, I will judge you a little bit. How many of you have already put up Christmas decor? Okay. Pastor Weaver, your hand should be up. You got a Christmas tree up all year round in your office. I've seen it. You can't hide it. I'm the type after Thanksgiving, boom, then we can go forward. We can celebrate. But don't skip over the best holiday, Thanksgiving, in my mind. I love to eat. I love to hang out. I love family. Uh, family's very important to me from Minnesota. And, uh, you know, there's nothing like, you know, some people are like, oh, Thanksgiving with, uh, you know, the craziness of Black Friday and I get to go shopping. Some shop till they drop. I eat till I drop. And so my mom makes the best hot dish. It's called a hot dish because we're from Minnesota. Don't come at me. It's in the Bible. Uh, but I love Thanksgiving, and uh, you know, I don't want this to be what, what I feel like God has laid on my heart. Uh, I don't want it to be just another like, oh, we should be more thankful message. I don't want it to be a, a more thank, like you should be more thankful than you are conviction, but I really want to dive down deep into how envy and jealousy can really steal Thanksgiving and steal gratitude and ultimately steal praise um, and, and steal Uh, the glory that God has and should have in our lives. And so I just want to break them down in in, in the the little time I have here to share with you. But the Bible, and through many different verses, if you look up these topics um, that are pretty interchangeable with envy or or jealousy or or being uh, or coveting, uh, greed, pride, these things kind of all, uh, it, they're all in the same family, if you will, especially in Scripture. And we see that they're all interconnected, but they all have the same source. They are different arms, if you will, different shoots out of the same ground in Scripture. And, and all of these things uh, have to do with what I want, what I desire, that I am the center of attention, I am the center of my life, I am the center of your life, and I am in the center of God's life. Um, even um, 
these terms are referred to, to advance, to gain, to protect selfishly of what I have, their desires for self and to advance what I have in my kingdom. And that's why pride fits into this family so easily. I believe that sometimes in this season and we encourage being thankful and you may go around the table and say, name one thing that you're thankful for and, you know, and, but we, we challenge you during the season, well, don't be envious of what's not yours, you know, don't be jealous of, you know, what, what people can take away from you and, and stuff like that. We kind of sometimes, I think, make it a lot more lighthearted than it really is and, and the root of that and that pride of what's going on um, means a lot more to God than I think we think it does. And um, some think maybe it's just like a harmless desire. You know, I went to your house. You have a bigger TV than I have. I want that TV. You have a better car, a better person in your life. You have better opportunities, whatever it may be. Uh, you have better, doesn't have to be something as tangible as stuff either, but I, you, you have what I want and what I desire and what I need, and then it moves into what I deserve. And, uh, you know, it, it, I think envy and jealousy are just symptoms of a greater sickness of selfishness. If you break down what sin is in its essence, in its true form, sin is selfishness. Sin is not just this Bible word, but it truly is, uh, it's all, it has to be all about me, not about God. It's a rebellion from what his kingdom is, and it turns it into mine. Sin in its nature is selfish. Everything that I do that would fall into sin is to help me, myself, and I. Think about it, every single sin can lead back to self, every single one. Every single thing that we do, it's to bring pleasure, comfort, power, control, whatever it may be, it's ultimately the elevation of self. And, and even in the Bible, it talks about even that our sinful natures, our sinful desires come from self at its core. Think about the first sins, the first rebellions from God we see were in heaven. And Satan, Lucifer at the time was the worship pastor, if you will. He was in charge of the worship. He was in charge of the praise and the thanksgiving that ultimately God goes to God and God deserves. And he started coveting that and saying, I think I deserve that. I think I, I, I want that. I want to be on the throne. I want me, myself, and I. And it was truly this selfish desire, this pride, this envy that turned an angel into a demon move forward a little bit and we have humanity and the opportunity arises where Eve and Adam can rebel against God and we can just think of that, oh, it, you know, they got tricked or man, that fruit just looked better, but at its core, they, they were believing lies that would elevate themselves. Eve, I want to be like God. I want, what is he hiding? What is he keeping from us? I want more for me. Adam, even after that, lied to God and said it was all her fault. Why? Because he was selfish in preserving his own life. The selfishness is the root of these things and we see through their lineage and it just continues to us today. We see through technology or I have nothing wrong with living in America. It's amazing and we're crazy blessed, but we also are known around the world as being entitled as being prideful and selfish. <laughs> I've been blessed to travel a lot and go on a lot of different missions trips and it is pretty eye-opening to see uh, the labels on Americans and honestly, a lot of them are true. And it has to do with self. See, coveting and do not covet in the Bible, it comes from Exodus and we see that's the 10th commandment of these 10 commandments of part of God's law that he gives. And I believe that even though that's the 10th commandment, I believe that it, the coveting selfish nature causes the rest or can cause the rest of the nine commandments. Think about if you break it down, if I like your wife, I want her for my own wife, 
I will commit adultery with her, but that didn't just come out of nowhere because I coveted, I want it for me. I will do, if I want something bad enough, I may steal, kill, or destroy to get it. If I, if I truly wanna elevate my control, my power, my pleasure, what I wanna do in this life, I put things, even myself, and create idols that are above God in my life. All of these you can break down and I won't take the time to, but they, the root of that comes from the selfishness that rears its ugly head in its early stages is this envy or jealousy of I want more. See, in turn, it, envy and jealousy, they're the desires to elevate myself and they make me say I want that and I deserve that. I deserve recognition, I deserve that raise, that money, that stuff. I deserve the comfort, I deserve this. And we, be, we become so entitled. And we can often so think of, well, the ki- this, this next generation, man, they're just so entitled with their phones and their you know, weird lingo that we talked about a couple weeks or months ago and on the Sunday morning. And they're so entitled, but it really stems all the way up we sometimes can be entitled all the way to our graves. And uh, that's why I believe that when we get into the state of such selfishness and entitlement, when something doesn't go my way or a storm comes in my life or pain or suffering, that's why it's so easy to put a blame on God. It's so easy to do that. We're talking with our high school students right now breaking down the question of why do bad things happen to good people? If God was truly loving, why would he cause me to suffer or allow me to go through pain? If God was so good, why would he allow suffering in this world? And it's those questions from entitlement in the negative that we can cause and bring to God and say, I deserve this, why didn't this go my way? And it separates us from God, just like it separated Adam and Eve, separated Lucifer. And I want to break down quick, and I don't mean to sound grim or, you know, beat down on anyone, but it's a beautiful picture and a humbling picture to realize that in this life we don't deserve anything but the cross. And I'm not talking about Jesus on the cross, we deserve the cross. We deserve that instrument of torture, that instrument of death. We deserve that. All of who we are, all our rebellion from the second that we're born, the Bible talks about we deserve it. We're even born, you know if you're a parent in this place, and I know because I was a kid once, that we're so naturally drifting towards me, mine, and no before we learn anything else. It's a lot harder to give up. It's a lot harder to share, even as a child. That comes from within. See, we deserve death. We deserve hell. We deserve the grave. We deserve those things. And the humbling truth, and if God were to take my health, take my job, take my money, take my stuff, take my wife, take my family, and leave me dead in a ditch somewhere, God would have done no wrong and I would have deserved no less. It's a humbling and often a thought that we don't wanna focus on. It's not a happy-go-lucky thought in a season of thanksgiving. But once we truly understand that fact, I've heard it said, once I truly understand the weight of my sin, then I can truly understand the weight of God's grace and his mercy in my life. I can take that cross, I can take what Jesus did as he came from perfection and gave all of himself in the greatest act of selfless sacrifice and love for me. I can take that for granted. I've been in church my whole life. I grew up on the pew, and to say Jesus died for you, he loves you, it can fly right over my head. And I never want that to be the case. I want to truly know I don't sit in this fetal position of sorrow and depression. That's not what I'm saying, but when we truly grasp how much we deserved the cross and that Jesus fulfilled that, 
my goodness, that changes how I think. I'm no longer entitled. I am no longer deserving. It's no longer about me, myself, and I, but it all points to Jesus then. It all points to God's kingdom. Psalm 103, one of my favorite chapters, and these are my favorite verses in the Bible. He does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. We deserve harsh punishment. Not because he's some God that's just angry at us, that just wants to beat us down. He's waiting for you to trip up. That's not God. It's it's because we took a step away. Verse 11, for his unfailing love towards those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. He doesn't treat us as we deserve, but he sent his son and all that selfishness can be removed from us. All that sin can be removed. See, when it comes to envy and jealousy, this isn't just a thing that's like, oh, I, should, I probably shouldn't do that. We see in Luke 9, 23, that Jesus is speaking to the crowd. Then he said to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. You must take up your cross daily and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you'll save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but you yourself are lost or destroyed? Envy and jealousy saying, I want more of the world. I want more of this. It's my way, God. It's my own way. It's my plans. It's me first. But in the most basic challenging statement of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, Jesus is speaking directly against the desires and the feelings of envy and jealousy. So it's more than just a a slap on the wrist, no, no. I think it's a bigger heart issue for us that we need to constantly remember. If I'm even, even though what maybe what I desire isn't the whole world and isn't gonna kill or hurt someone, but that desire, it, it, it grows into selfishness, that desire and the envy and jealousy, it elevates me, it entitles me. So if envy and jealousy are elevating me and self and entitling me, then thanksgiving and praise elevate God. At its very nature, at its very core, if I were to thank you for, if, if I brought you to my house and, and, and you, you helped me work on something in my house and I thanked you for it, I'm acknowledging that I needed you. I'm, it's, an, it's a simple acknowledgement of, man, thank you, like I appreciate, I needed that. And so thanksgiving at its core elevates when we thank God, when we praise him, not just at the dinner table, for, for once out of our week, but we, we, can't, we thank God for, for our health. Well, when's, the, when's the last time we've thanked Jesus for breath in our lungs? It's him that gives it to us every day. And when I thank him for my very breath, then I know that this life isn't mine. This is borrowed breath. This is a borrowed body. And there's, that's our hope for the future that God, we get to be reunited with our family member. We get to be in heaven if Jesus comes back or we die if he, if he tarries, and man, we get all that new. Psalm 22, three, yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. I love this verse and this picture that our praise, that our thanksgiving enthrones God. He is, he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He has lordship and mastery over our lives. That's not a hot word to say in this culture. No one wants to be mastered. No one wants to be controlled. No one wants to know that I don't have the final say. But when we praise God, when we, when we thank him for things and give him thanksgiving, we are literally putting him on the throne of our lives. He is enthroned by our praise. We, we see in scripture that battles are won. People are set free. People are healed when we praise and we give thanks. Because it makes God the king of our hearts. It makes him the king of our lives. Psalm 100, it's a psalm of thanksgiving. 
Just, just really dive into the words as I read this. Shout with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his. We are his people, the, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his, his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever. And his faithfulness continues to each generation. You want to know the best way to enter into the throne room of God? To enter into the physical presence of God? Thanksgiving. That's the best way. And I challenge you in your personal time, when you're, when you're seeking after Jesus, it's easy to go with him to our uh, requests first. It's easy to even start out maybe with some so, uh, like worship songs but the, or, or, or even reading the Bible. And those are not bad things, but let's put the first thing first. And God is the first thing and the, the king of our hearts. Let's enthrone him by giving thanks and taking a moment and just thanking him. Pastor Brett, would you just come? Even Philippians 4, it talks about how we can go to God. We, it's, it's the, 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 there's a verse in there that says, man, I, I cast all my anxiety on him because he cares. I can go to him with my prayers through thanksgiving. I go to God with my prayer through thanksgiving. That's a way that I can get right in direct contact with my Savior. It's through thanksgiving. Then it says we get peace from anxiety, peace from storms. See, thanksgiving and praise to God aren't things that we should do as Christians, but really, they're our only response. It's, it's our only response to what God has done in and through our lives and will continue to do. No matter what you're facing, no matter what you've been, God is still good. He is still on the throne. Would you stand all across this place? And I just want to give us a couple moments and purposefully not singing a, 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 like a, an exact song purposefully because I want to give us a chance and challenge us to really, with your own voice, out of your own heart, enthrone God of your life with thanksgiving. What are you thankful for today? See, thanksgiving, if envy and jealousy say, I want what you have, thanksgiving helps us to say, I want what I have and I'm thankful for what I have. Let me challenge you with this question. What if you woke up tomorrow and all you had is what you thanked God for today? I'll say it again. What if you woke up tomorrow and all you had is what you thanked God for today? I know in my life, a lot of times I wouldn't have breath. I wouldn't have life. I wouldn't have a job. I, I, I wouldn't have family. These basic things. I wouldn't have the opportunity to come and safely worship Jesus. Would you bow your heads across this place? If you're here and you say, man, Pastor Luke, I've never, I've never put God on the throne of my life. I've never made him king, period. And I want to, I want, I want to make the best decision. I, I, I know and I recognize that he died for my sin, for my rebellion. He, he put that as far as the east is from the west. And I, and I want to give my life to him as, as, as a, just a, that's the basic, most basic and most powerful response I can do is just give him praise and give him my life. With nobody looking around, would you just raise your hand and say, that's me. I want that. I want to give Jesus my heart. I want to give him my life. Yeah, absolutely. I see your hand. I see your hand. Absolutely. Praise Jesus. Anybody else? Thank you, Jesus. You can put your hands down. Before I pray for you and we kind of break, like I said, Pastor Brett's just gonna kind of create an atmosphere of worship and thanksgiving, and I challenge you to create a spot before you leave with your own words. You can write it down or you can speak it, but would you just thank God for what we have? And that will immediately start attacking the selfishness the pride, even the anxiety, the turmoil, and putting him back on the throne of our lives. Jesus, we thank you. We come before you tonight, and we just thank you. We're so in awe 
of the sacrifice that you made. God, something we could never dig ourselves out of, something we could never do enough, give enough, try enough, feel enough, pray enough to get out of. And you sent your son on the cross that we deserved. You didn't treat us as we deserved. You treated your own son as we deserved. And we thank you for that sacrifice. Help us and anyone who made a decision that truly make you the king of their lives. Bless them tonight. God, to challenge us to give you more praise, give you more thanksgiving in every situation because you are good and you are faithful. We praise you tonight in your holy name. Amen. Why don't you just take a moment and just praise him and just thank him wherever you're at.